The Winnipeg.net User Group 2016 season is brought to you by Aptius, IQ Metrics, Imaginet, Vision Critical, and Microsoft. So we're good now? You're being recorded. Okay. Yay, it works. No, it doesn't. Well, <laughs> half of it works. Oh. Wow. It's so much more intimate. And the floor is yours. All right, so before I continue, uh, I was talking a lot about like ES 2015, ES 2016, ES 5, ES 6, ES 7. How many people actually looked into those new standards? Does anyone know anything about them? You have? Anyone else? Nobody? A little bit? A little bit here and there? Okay, I'm about to blow your mindset. So what I want to look at next are some of the features that TypeScript is going to have. And this, this includes a lot of stuff that comes from ES, ES6 and ES7, so those two new standards that are coming up. So we're talking classes. Now, if you're coming from like a .NET, C Sharp point of view, like that's crazy. This is coming, this is basically turning JavaScript into C Sharp. So it's like, it's basically C Sharp for the web. So we're talking modules and namespaces now. Uh, so now, rather than using stuff like require.js or any sort of module loader like AMD, uh, we're talking, this is just part of the standard now. You don't need to bring in another library that's just like going to be supported. Arrow functions, so these are like lambdas. Uh, those are also like, same thing as from C Sharp. Uh, they bring your context in, so now it's, they, basically they make your functions a lot smaller, a lot more concise. Uh, and they bring in your, they maintain your this context. So, you know, if you have some sort of callback and you just write function whatever, right? Normally the this is just set to, I don't know, undefined or something. You know, it makes sure that the, this context uh, stays in line with whatever the parent uh, parent scope is. Uh, so now this, this one is specific to ES6, or TypeScript rather. This one isn't actually in ES6 or ES7. So the static typing is the big part of TypeScript. And this is the, this is the real reason why you want to use this. This is going to eliminate a ton of subtle errors. This is going to make sure that your functions and interfaces all make sense. They all mesh nicely. And it's going to tell you if you have issues before you send your JavaScript out to the page. So like, this, like you can see in this list, this is a lot of nice stuff that we see in a ton of other languages that just like wasn't present in JavaScript. Right? This is stuff that, this is not reinventing the wheel. This is stuff that we've done already. Now we're just bringing it to the web. So like I said, namely C Sharp, stuff like Java, right? Taking stuff that we're familiar with there and bringing it to the web. So how does that actually work? Uh, so what TypeScript is, is it's just this TS file, right? So now you have ES6, ES7 features, static typing thrown in there. You have your TypeScript <coughs> compiler or transpiler, depending on the way you want to talk about it. Because uh, technically it's just taking the source and outputting another source. So what your TypeScript compiler does is takes that TS file and then produces JS. Now this JS, you can configure what the output is, but typically what you're producing is you're producing ES5 compatible, so current browsers, you're producing ES5 compatible JS out of that compiler. Right? So you're taking all of this TS and you're producing stuff that people can run in their current browser. Right? You, like I said before, you actually get to use all that cool stuff and then people can use it today. So the TypeScript compiler is really cool. It's, it's, it's basically magic. It's, it's nuts. It takes all of your TypeScript and then, like I said, transpiles to ES3 even if you want to. But I don't know why you want to do that. ES5 or ES6 once it's more well supported. Uh, so there's that option available so that a couple of years, years down the road when ES6 support is, is out there, we can start using those ES6 features and maybe get a little bit of a performance enhancement out of that. Um, one of the crazy things about this compiler is that there's actually no performance penalty for any of the typing that we do. It's actually all stripped out at compile time. So we can have all the nice features that make it easy to build these complex applications and not have it affect our final product. So let's talk a little bit about these features that I just talked about, like the classes, modules, namespaces. So the things I want to I want to actually focus on are the static typing, classes, namespaces, and modules, 
And then declarations, which I haven't talked about yet, but I will in a bit. So the first thing I want to talk about is this is what typing actually looks like. So we've talked about it a bunch already. Here it is. This is, this is it right here. It looks like regular JavaScript, but if you look, there's just the colon and then number, colon, number. So what you're specifying there is, like I said, a lot like C Sharp, you're just specifying the type. So there's, there's a bunch of different types. There's numbers, um, there's string, there's uh, Boolean values, there's class values, anything that you can think of. And the compiler is really good at knowing what you're trying to do. So if you look here, there's foo, which you're actually specifying a string and then passing in a string. Bar here, you're actually not specifying the type. You're just telling it that it equals one, two, three. And the compiler just knows like, oh, you probably just want to make that a number value, right? It, it understands that. If it can't figure out what you're trying to do, it'll make it this other new type called any. Now this is the type that allows us to support all old JavaScript. Um, all of the typing in, old Java, in, in JavaScript that doesn't have any types on it uh, is considered any. And it doesn't provide you any of the nice typing features or any of the nice IntelliSense, uh, but it will run. So like I was saying, we have all the primitives. We have number, string, Boolean, arrays. We have class types. So that's like regular classes, any sort of objects that you want to create. We have enumerations that you can create. And the any type, like I said, that one's super special because that one makes it super easy to work with older JavaScript. So the great part about typing it in TypeScript is that this it's kind of optional. Right? You don't really have to do it. And it's very gradual, too. What you can do is you can add typing to certain in certain places. Even that function that I was showing you earlier, may, maybe one of the parameters isn't type. You just don't specify anything. TypeScript doesn't really care. Uh, it'll just assume that's in any type and let you do whatever you want with it. So it's really nice because you can fine tune the level of typing that you want to do. Maybe you want to do none. Maybe you want to do a little bit here and there to eliminate maybe some subtle errors. Or you can go all the way to just super, super strict and not allow the any type at all. So like I was saying, you can fine tune it. And what the compiler does is if you don't specify anything, it just assumes any. So it lets you do whatever you want to it. And the great part about this is even though it isn't output at the end, uh, all of the typing isn't output, it allows the tools to infer a lot more about what you're building and, and the calls you're making, right? It allows, it gives you the ability to have in better IntelliSense. So I'm not sure if you guys have used um, IntelliSense a bunch of JavaScript, but it's kind of hit and miss. Like it shows you a lot of things that aren't super applicable. I don't know, for me, this is maybe a couple of years ago. I was using WebStorm, and I would press or I would type in whatever I was gonna, uh, some variable name. I hit dot, and it would show me literally every single method that I had ever, ever defined in this project. Like it's just like it has no idea what that item, what that object is, right? So this having that typing in there <coughs> allows the tools to say, hey, hold on, these methods aren't actually present on this type. Let's just show this small set. Right, so it actually makes development a lot easier. It, even without all of the error checking at compile time, it just makes writing it a lot, a lot more nice. You know, it's, it's, I don't know, it, it's so much better. And so like I was saying, editors understand how the types flow through your code. And, I, and I'll show you that a little bit more. I mean, a little example was when I just said equals one, two, three, and it just knows that it's a number, right? And the great part about this is if you have a giant project, it simplifies refactoring. So if you have a class on there and you want to change the the method name, um, you know, like get items to like get whatever, you can just say, oh yeah, just refactor that one function, and your tools will know, oh, that's specified in these different places. It doesn't have to guess because it knows those types. <coughs> Anything that's using that type will get renamed automatically. So it really makes refactoring a large project a lot easier. So this is the class syntax here. So I mean, this is, this is probably super familiar to you guys that use C Sharp. <coughs> Basically just class, the class keyword, the name of it, some curly braces, and then you specify your properties. You can specify any sort of functions you want or the constructor in there. 
And what's cool about this is this is actually ES6 too. This is not specific to TypeScript. So this is this is the future of JavaScript right here. So you can have public ones, public properties. You can have private properties. Uh, specify their types. You can have inheritance. Uh, it, on, it's basically exactly like C sharp. Is there like interfaces? A, what's that? Interfaces. There are interfaces. Yeah, and abstract classes as well. Actually, yeah, I just mentioned that right there. So static variables, uh, static functions, a lot of stuff that you come to expect with C sharp. Like this is super surprising when I read about this. This is basically all the nice stuff that you use in all these compiled languages just brought to the web. So what I want to do now is just go and actually start using it a little bit. So I'll show you how the typing kind of flows down. I'll just load up this one here. So this is kind of an example of how we do things today in regular JavaScript, right? You know, you might just create an object, you add some properties to it, you add a function maybe, or you create like a constructor function and maybe you add it to like even the prototype, right? And that's how you do, you know, add it to, um, that's how you kind of, kind of do some inheritance. You might have that prototype chain, right? This is not at all how you do it anymore. With TypeScript, it looks a lot more like this. So we have our class, person, we have name, string, constructor, string, right? And the great part about this is that now when I say person here, it gives me just those two things. It knows right away. Did, did someone want to say that? Yeah, I know. Isn't it awesome? Right? That's so cool. When I started using this, especially in Visual Studio Code, it works really well. Um, actually, what's cool about this, this is kind of an aside, uh, TypeScript is not actually just the compiler. So the TypeScript team actually built what's called uh, TypeScript Language Services. And it's a little server that also runs alongside, well, it doesn't run alongside the compiler. It just runs within the editor uh, that you're using. And it provides all the IntelliSense to the editor. So when you're writing a plugin for a new editor, uh, all you have to do is talk to that language service service uh, services server, and uh, it will give you this IntelliSense. You say, you know, my I'm looking at this. Um, I'm looking at this item in this file at this position. Get me all of the suggestions, and it will provide you all of these suggestions for you. So, what we're seeing is we're seeing a lot of people build um, build extensions for tons of different editors out there really quickly because they don't have to invent the IntelliSense for them, right? All they have to do is talk to that interface. And it's all through JSON, it all runs on, on Node, it's all written in TypeScript. So it, that's why you can get really good IntelliSense in a bunch of different editors right now. So that was kind of an aside. But this is, this is what it, it looks like now. And what we can do is I can actually, here, I'll split this for a second. And we can look at what's actually output here. So this is the JavaScript that's output. It's a little bit more messy, as you can see. Uh, but it does a lot of things that we would normally do when we're writing this. You know, We're adding it to the prototype, defining the function just like that, uh, You know, having everything in closures and, and making sure it's not polluting the global namespace. Right? It's doing a lot of, it's producing nice JavaScript, right? But you don't have to actually care about that. This is all just produced from this. So what we can do here is, actually, I don't know if I want to talk about that yet. I got to go back to my slides here for a second and talk about some cool new features beyond that. So I mean, everyone's pretty aware of cla how classes work, um, how all these functions on classes work, things like that. Like that's pretty basic. Uh, now we get to some of the more interesting things that are added, both in ES6 and TypeScript. So we get into union types. Now, this is something that was added because a lot of the times when you're writing JavaScript, uh, you might be calling it with, say, like a string, or because, because nothing was typed, you could call it with basically whatever you want. You can call a function with a string, and it'll just handle that. Um, you can call it with an object and it'll just figure it out. You might do like a type of or an instance of or something like that to try and figure out what was actually passed to you. Um, in this case, if you're passing multiple things to a function, you can just say, oh, hey, I'm expecting one of these, one of these types, right? 
expecting that type or that type. You can add a third one if you want. You can just keep adding to that list. You say, I'm expecting one of these few types here. So you still get the advantage of typing, but, you still, but you're able to pass kind of whatever you want based on what you specify. So the problem with this right now, though, is that that person object or that person parameter can just be anything, really. Right? It can be either a person or a string. We don't know. When we're doing these console logs, we don't actually know what's going to be output. Uh, so that's that's where something like type guards comes in. So this is a part of the language services that I was talking about, is where you, when you do an instance of, say like person instance of person, it's going to give you really nice IntelliSense for that console log. It's going to say, oh, person, you did an instance of right above it to say that it is at, in fact a person class. Um, so it has a name value on it, right? Whereas in the else there, it's not going to give you that dot name. It's going to say dot char app or dot to string or whatever, right? It's going to know right away based on your code that it's the string value and not the person, even though either one could be passed in. That's even more powerful than what we get in C sharp. So yeah. If something is type of, and then inside that if statement, it doesn't give you different IntelliSense. It, it, well, see, I haven't, used, I haven't done that, but that's actually really, really interesting. I didn't realize it didn't do that. No, well, I mean, I think they call it flow analysis, right? It's mm -hmm. like expecting the flow of your code yeah, yeah. to confine, constrain the types. Yeah. Awesome. So, no, it's, it's super cool. And, and it's all part of those language services. So it's available in tons of different editors already, right? Like I said, you don't have to reinvent the wheel every time you want to put it in a new editor. Getting back to this, we're, there's also support for generics, as you can see here. Right? Just like C Sharp, you can define like, oh, this, there's type T, and you can say, oh, it extends a person, um, person T. You can even say, you know, it returns T. Um, or you could say it returns um, some other type. In this case, what it'll do is it knows that T is going to have a name on it. It's not sure what else it'll have on it, but it knows it at least has everything that's on person, right? So again, very similar to C Sharp. So there's a ton of other features here that I don't really have time to talk about. Um, intersection types, those are very similar to the union types that I was talking about, except it says you can, basically you specify them and it checks to see what properties are available on both and only lets you use those ones. So rather than doing the checking like instance of or type of, it just allows you to use them straight up but only the functions that are on both items. Um, type aliasing, you can say, you know, this is of type whatever, or whatever, or whatever. String literal types, um, those are kind of like enumerations. I can show you that a little bit later. The polymorphic this um, makes it so that you can pass back, um, you know, if, if you're doing a bunch of chained functions, you can say, um, you know, dot add or dot subtract or whatever. The polymorphic this allows you to pass back the original class even, so if it's a subclass, so there's a person, and then there's like, like I had before in that other one, secret agent, right? Um, if you're doing like a dot add to that, it'll pass back the secret agent type rather than the person type. And then there's obviously tons of other ES2015. So honestly, I, I recommend going to take a look at this. All the new ES2015 and ES2016 features, even if you don't use TypeScript, um, there's a ton of really cool stuff coming up. And there's other transpilers available too. TypeScript isn't the only one. I just feel like this is the one that's the most fleshed out, has a lot of, a lot of force behind it in terms of uh, support because of Microsoft. Um, Google's behind it. Uh, in fact, Facebook React works well with it as well. So it seems like there's a lot of big players that are aligning themselves with TypeScript. But either way, like I said, if you're not going to use it, still look at those. The guy who invented it is the same guy that invented C Sharp. Yeah, actually, I mentioned that later in the resources. Right. Anders Heilsberg. Um, honestly, go to, go to YouTube and search him out, and he'll have tons of really, really good talks on TypeScript, and he'll do a way better job than I'm doing right now. So I want to go to some more of this typing here. So if I go to in here, I can use some of those nice features that I was talking about. You know, I have like the extends person um, creation here. I have just an array. So you can specify an array. You can actually, what's really cool about this 
is that you can use those union types even in arrays as well. You can say that this person list is actually an array of either person or strings. And now it'll accept, accept either one. Now it's going it's to give me an error because it's already defined. But now it'll accept either one. So you can use those union types anywhere that you use regular types. So you can do a lot of really cool stuff with it. So uh, actually, another, another really cool feature, this is kind of an aside as well. These template strings, I believe they're part of ES6. Uh, can you actually, can you guys all see that fine? Do I have to make that bigger? Make it a little bit bigger. A little bit bigger? OK. Perfect. Is that better? OK. So these template strings are super, super nice. Because uh, it's, it's kind of like string.format, right? Except you just use a back tick, you use the dollar sign there. And in here, it also gives you all the IntelliSense as well. So you can say ID or dot name. Last C sharp allows this. What's that? Last C sharp allows this. Mm -hmm. So, again, a lot of parallels between this and C sharp. <coughs> so, again, there I'm passing in an array with both different types. Um, another nice feature here is the, the of. Um, it rather than so a lot of the times when you're doing iteration you might do a for loop with you know var i equals whatever or you can try and use the var something var p in person list but that doesn't always work correctly right it's returning the property names on the object so what they did is they added of and now this does what you actually expect it to do so this is another one of those nice things and TypeScript will handle this this is an ES6 uh, feature, but if we look back over to the JavaScript here, you'll see that the compiler is doing a lot of cool stuff. Oh, here, I'll move this over. The compiler is doing a lot of cool stuff to hide all that from us. So if we look here, we can see that it's turning it into a regular for loop. Close this one. And it's it's getting, you know, it's getting grabbing the index and creating that that p variable for us. So yeah, it does let you use all these ES6 features, but it ensures that you're still compatible with ES5. So let's go back to here. So I mentioned declaration files earlier, and uh, now let's actually talk about them a little bit. So I, I talked about support for all these older libraries like jQuery, right? Obviously something big like that, we, we need to be able to support that stuff. Uh, but jQuery was never written in TypeScript and it probably won't be, if ever. Won't be soon, if ever. Um, so what we created, or what the TypeScript team created, um, is declaration files. So what these are, these contain the class, function, and variable decla declarations of that library, but they don't include any implementation for it. So basically this is just saying that, oh hey, there's this library that exists. It has all of these functions on it, all of these variables on it, um, but it doesn't actually tell you how, how they work. So what you do is you'll include the JS file, um, however, however you like, depending on your build process, and then you have TypeScript refer to this declaration file, and it gives you all of the nice typing in TypeScript without actually having the library written in TypeScript. So it provides the compiler with tons and tons of type and interface information. And, and again, this goes back to the language services. It uses all of that and makes it super, super nice to use. And there's thousands of these available um, on a couple of sites. There's definitely type and, and now typings. And these are people that are hand making these actually uh, for tons and tons and tons of different um, libraries. So I believe definitely type now has something like, I don't know, it's over a thousand, it might be like 1,500 different um, definition or declaration files. Um, and both of these actually have uh, tools that will allow you to download these automatically. So it's, it's kind of like a package manager for these declaration files. So what you'll be able to do is say, you know, like typings and then install, you know, jQuery, right? And it'll go to the site, grab the latest declaration file, and just throw it right into your project. There's also a tsconfig file. So now this is kind of like a TypeScript <coughs> project file. 
Uh, because it's supported by so many different editors and the compiler needs to know so much, and same with the language services, they created this thing called tsconfig that handles, that contains all of the different configuration for, for compilation. So I'll, I'll show you an actual one in a bit. Uh, but just to give you kind of an idea, uh, it, it defines a ton of project configuration. So like target compatibility, that's where you can specify that. Um, whatever files are going to be included or excluded, you know, maybe you don't want to, you might want to exclude stuff like anything in the node modules folder, for example, right? You can, you can tell that in the tsconfig. And this, the great part about this is that basically all editors use the tsconfig file. So it doesn't really matter if you switch from one editor to another or two different people use two different editors. They, they all should support the tsconfig file. Uh, it also lets you support, or it also lets you specify the module system that you want to use. So if you're using Node, for example, you'll, you'll specify common JS and any sort of modules that you create or you, you import into your module or file, um, it'll change the ES6 syntax into whatever system that you specify. So I'll show you that in a little bit here. Actually, I'll show you that right now. So here is just a small Node server that I, that I set up. So let's go to, I have three files here. So I have main TS, I have server TS, and then I have uh, some validators. So if we look here quick, we can see that I'm referencing one of those declaration files. Uh, so I just brought it in here, so node.t.d.ts. Now in here, this again, this is like handwritten. There's tons and tons of stuff in here. This is everything that Node supports is in here. You know, interfaces, different, different classes, it's all in here. And it lets you leverage all of those types uh, in your file. So I can go back to server, rather, uh, and I can import create server from HTTP. So now this is importing a module from Node. So now notice I'm not actually bringing the implementation in. Because I'm running it in Node, it'll just have all that, ex that's all just exists in the environment. Uh, but bringing in the definition file lets me do stuff like import this from HTTP. So, and I can also do exports as well. I'll show you that in the validators. That's kind of a better example. But basically, this is this is writing TypeScript that runs on Node. Like it just, it just works. It just works perfect. So here I'm bringing in that hello server. So that was in server TS. I'm importing that module uh, from from that file. And then I'm going to create just a new new node server there. So now I have some postal codes and zip codes. Uh, I'm not really doing anything with that, uh, but I'll show you. But I'm going to do something with that in a second here. But let's go take a look at these guys. So the way TypeScript works, um, I think it's, I think it's very similar to Node uh, JavaScript running on Node. Is that every file exists as its own external module. Um, so then they're not all concatenated together. They just kind of exist as individual modules that you can import. But you have to specify what you're exporting from them. So a lot of the times there's kind of like, especially with like CommonJS, AMD, there's a lot of messy syntax that, that gets involved when you're trying to do, um, when you're trying to define a module or import a module. There's a lot of stuff going on. Here it makes it dead simple. This is, this is ES6, also supported in TypeScript. Basically all you do is you say export. That's it. You say export this class, export that class, export a function if you want to. Right? You can just say export, um, you know, some function, blah, right? And it will export function. That would help. Um, just export that function from that module, and that's it. That's all you really have to do. Alternatively, down here, you can say export and then specify a list of things. Um, they both work the same way, it just kind of depends on the way you want to do it. So from the validators TS, I'm exporting um, a postal code validator and I'm exporting a zip code validator. So if we go back to this main TS, there's a couple ways I can import this. I can say either import it and then specify what I want to import from that file. I can say import absolutely everything and say, you know, assign it to this variable. So in that case, what's going to happen is I can say, now I can say validators dot gives me postal code, gives me the sum function that I just defined, zip code validator, 
right? So there's a bunch of different ways that you can import these modules. And um, this last one here, also, if you specify a default export, um, you can use that as well. So if you go into validators and say, like, export uh, default, what that'll mean is if you just don't specify what, you're ex what you want to import, it'll just automatically import that one thing. So if you have one class that's super important in that module, you just make that the default one, and it makes it easier to import. So I'm going to get rid of that because it's going to give me an error. But... And now what I can do is I can use that right here. I can just say validators, you know, uh, postal code validator, um, and then validate some postal code, right? And same thing. And, and like I said before, all of those services are running in the background behind code, and it's just giving me all of these suggestions right as I type. So I can say some zip code, it's doing that validation. And what I'll do for this one is I'll actually run it here. So this is a little bit scary. I hope this actually works. Um, one thing about tsconfig that I actually didn't mention, here's an actual tsconfig file. And so now this here, specifying target, the module system, Node uses CommonJS, so that's why I specified that, that there. When I was talking about dialing up types, um, you, can, you can say true here. You can change that to true, which means that the compiler will never assume any, and it'll actually throw an error to say like, hey, you didn't actually define a type for this, right? So that, that's if you want to go really strict and, and make sure that everything is typed. Um, just some other stuff for removing comments, source maps. And in this case, I'm doing an exclude of typings. That doesn't actually exist, but you can, that's where you would exclude folders or specific files. So now what I do is um, I take, just go into my terminal here, and the TypeScript compiler is TSC. Super easy. You can either specify, you know, I can specify main TS here if I wanted to, or if I don't specify anything, what it'll actually do, um, right now I'm, I'm just in this folder, right? I'm just in this demo folder. And what TSC will do is it will actually look at the root of that folder for a tsconfig file and use all the configuration out of there. So if I just hit enter here, it should build and output it just fine. And what I can do is I can run node main.js, say listening on port 1234, and I should be able to grab there. And now it's validating my postal codes. So what it's doing is it's, it's going in and we go back to the code, main TS here, is grabbing these, these validators, and then from, from separate files, these aren't concatenated at all, it's just going to a different file and grabbing that module, and then I'm able to use it just right there. If we look at the JS for this, um, we can see that in this case it's using require. So this is, this is what node supports. If I changed it to, if I go into tsconfig here, uh, I can change this to, and the other part is it gives you autocomplete there as well. I can say like system or AMD. AMD is not really, really ugly, so I'll show you that. So just take a look at this again. Look how pretty that is. And now we go to the JS, and we got like this define, and it like, has a bunch of required things, it outputs a bunch of crap to this function. Like, it's, it's just not pretty, right? It's way nicer to write this than it is this. But it'll output this for you. John, with those type definitions, it yeah. definitely type stuff. Yeah. So if you use that or not use that, that doesn't have any input on, on the output code, right? No, no, it doesn't. Um, because they don't have any implementation, and it's all just typing. It's just design time stuff. Exactly. So that's all happening just basically when you're in your editor or at compile time. If you're trying to compile it and it says, hey, that type isn't the right type, it'll throw an error, right? So for the JavaScript libraries that we use, right, my team is we use Bower, Open Manager, Package Manager. Yeah. So how, how would you get in the, the type definitions? Let's say you're using like uh, I don't know, Bootstrap JS or something. So you're going to pull in Bootstrap through Bower. How do I pull in definitely type stuff? Like how, how would you grab? So you, you mentioned a package manager. Like do you use a package manager? Do you check them into source control? 
how do you manage them? So my, my project might have a dozen JavaScript libraries that we pull into Bower. So I want to pull in a dozen mm -hmm. type definitions. Mm -hmm. for them. Yeah, so I mean, for what I've done is um, I use Bower as well as some of my projects. And what I do is I just bring them in using um, either one of those tools, like TSD or, or typings. And I can say, you know, install whatever, jQuery, for example. And it will create a typings folder, and it'll create some structure under there. And you can check that into source control if you want to. Um, you would manage it just like any other package. Like in Bower, like you can do, you can update that particular library, right? You can do the same thing with, with the typing. So does that kind of answer your question? I think so. Yeah? So actually, I could show you guys one more cool thing. This is, so this is a feature that's ES6 only right now. This is an ES7 feature. TypeScript compiles it down to ES6. Uh, but if I go here, I'm just gonna copy my complete one because I don't wanna waste too much more time. Uh, oh, my bad. Why is that not coming in? So this is a super cool feature. This is taking um, what's called a promise, which is an ES6 feature. And have, has anyone used promises before in their code? One, two, maybe. So basically what a promise is, is it lets you do some really neat stuff with um, async, uh, well, it, it makes asynchronous code a lot easier to write. So in this case, what I can do, I'll just write a new promise here. Promises are going to replace them, right? Because promises are still terrible. Prom well, see, this is what makes promises a little bit nicer, actually. So what I can do is, this is a regular promise, is I can use resolve, reject. And so this is, a, this is like a lambda, basically just a function I'm passing these parameters in. And uh, what I do is, in here, this is where you're going to like call your web service. Anything that's going to take a long time, just do it there. So in, in this case up here, I'm just doing a set timeout. And then once all that's done, you call resolve, and then you pass your data in. And this is where, so this is where you specify that call. So you can say like data is whatever. This is where you'd actually call the web service. And then when you're actually, when you want to execute the promise, or you can go like this, you can say dot then, after it's completed, you can write another function in here if you want to. And then it'll pass in the data that you resolve. And now you can use it. So I'll kind of go through a little bit slower here at how this works. So what you're doing is you're defining a new promise. And every promise has two functions passed into it. There's a resolve function and a reject function. So if everything goes well, you call the resolve function with your data, with whatever you want to, whatever you want to return. Um, so in this case, it'd be like a web service call. Um, and if something goes wrong, something explodes, right? The service is unavailable, whatever, you call reject on it. So this is, this is what you write on the end of actually calling it. And then when you want to use it, you do a dot then. So basically, this is saying, you know, let the promise do its thing. And then when it's done, you know, let me know, right? So all of this is done asynchronously. The promise kind of goes off and does its own thing and then calls your then function once it's complete. Now, the then is called if you recall resolve. If there's an error, what you'll want to do is you'll want to say catch. So you'll write another function here, and this will be the error passed in. And then you can do whatever error handling you want. Uh, so this is an ES6 feature. This is trying to make asynchronous stuff a little bit nicer, uh, but it can still be pretty hellish, especially if you're doing a bunch of them that are nested. right? So if I'm acting on this data and then I need to go call another web service here, right? I'm going to need another promise and another then, and they're going to keep getting nested and nested and nested, right? So that's the way ES6 does it right now. Uh, the way ES7 wants to do it is doing something called async await. So what you'll do, I'll just erase all this stuff here. So just kind of give you an idea of where we're at. This is, there's just a class here, service. It's got service URL. It's got print data for all items, just a function here. 
another function that actually goes to the service. So this one's gonna take a little while. It has a promise in it, as you can see. And what I'm doing is I'm just gonna call this service and say print data for items with IDs one, two, three, four, five. So what that's gonna do is it's gonna call this function up here with the items. So you can see that I'm specifying number array. Uh, I'm using the of again, going through those items one by one. And I'm opening a try catch here. Now this try catch, uh, I'll explain in a second, but this is the new way to wait for promises. You just set this a wait here and you say like, oh, I'm gonna call this. This is going to do something that takes a long time. And then let me know when it's finished and put the result in data. So now all of a sudden what you're doing is you have these long running tasks like getting data from a service, um, but you can write it in a way that looks synchronous, right? So now I can act on my data right here. So I can, I can just do whatever I want with it afterward. Now this happens, this doesn't happen synchronously. It doesn't block. What happens is the function executes to this point, waits until the web service returns, and then prints this out. And I'll show you that in a second. The other part of this, the try catch that I didn't explain, this catches any errors. So if I said, you know, failed to retrieve the item down here, this would throw the error, catch it here, and then this is how where you do your error handling. So if you wanted to do a bunch of calls one after another, you would say, you know, data equals await, and then some other long running function, right? Now this all looks like like plus one or whatever. This all looks like synchronous code, but it's actually running one after another, all asynchronously. So this takes that nested promise thing that I was talking about down here and turns it into just line after line after line. This is an ES7 feature, um, runs in TypeScript, but only right now it only works if you're targeting ES6. Uh, so it doesn't work doesn't work in ES5 browsers, which are the ones that we have today, uh, but they're working on it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to compile this and clear that up. I'm going to do TSC as I did. I have a TS config file here specifying ES6. That's my target because it's not supported. If, if I actually switch this to ES5, this is, this is what's crazy. That language service will tell me you can't actually do that because it's only available when you're targeting ECMAScript 6 and higher. So it gives you stuff like that. It tells you, hey, you can't actually use that feature right now. Hopefully we can soon, but for now you can't. So I'm gonna change this back to six. I'm going to make sure that compile. And then I'm gonna go in here and run this just with Node. And it's gonna give me a bunch of failures because I think I commented out the Resolve, but notice how it did it one after another after another. It's running them. If we go back to that for loop, it's going into this for loop, running this await, waiting until it's complete. Then it's going to do that console log and then continue to the next item. So it's going to do this one after another and then wait for them every single time. So if I change this to resolve here, that that won't, so give me that error. And I can just kind of show again that they're running one after another, right? And they're non-blocking, meaning that you can do a bunch of other stuff while that's happening. So let's continue. So those were kind of some demos, uh, some like ES6, ES7 modules, a bunch of stuff like that. I feel like I've been talking for a long time about this. How do we get TypeScript now? Because I've shown you all of this cool stuff, and now you probably want to try it out. Honestly, the easiest way to do this is, first of all, get Node. And once you have that, make sure it's version, um, I think it's version 5 that supports some nice new ES6 stuff, so that would be preferable. Um, then this is it. npm install, globally TypeScript, check the version, make sure it's 1.8 plus. Um, if, for those of you who haven't used npm, uh, it's a package manager that's included with Node and allows you to install a bunch of stuff super, super easily. Um, in this case, TypeScript, because it all runs on Node. 
So it's literally that easy. Just download Node, open your command line, type that, and you're good. You can do all the same stuff that I was just doing right now. You can use TSC. In fact, um, which I think it does come with Visual Studio Code as well, but this is the easiest way to get started. So I want to talk about supported editors as well. Um, I was using VS Code. Um, it's supported in tons of editors. You know, Visual Studio, Sublime, Atom, there's plugins for all of these. Um, and they all use that language services layer that I was talking about, so they're all going to have really good IntelliSense. Um, and when I was talking about support, uh, Microsoft is the one developing it, but they've actually got a lot of buy-in, like I said, from Google and Facebook. So Angular 2, actually Google developed something called AtScript, which they were going to use for Angular 2, and decided against it. They actually decided to use TypeScript instead. So they kind of took some of the features. Yeah? Um, fun fact, I have about that story, too. You do? Yeah. Do you, you want to share it? So they did their demo of Angular 2.0 with AtScript. And the first question they got was, do you know that TypeScript does this? And they're <laughs> like, yeah, but and they're like, why don't you just use TypeScript? That was the second question. And then that's the community actually went against that mm -hmm. script and they got it yeah, so Google's not decided they're going to do it themselves. Yeah, so like, oh yeah, totally. We we totally made that yeah, decision. It's totally their idea, but their whole community rejected it too. So, <laughs> so Angular two is now built in TypeScript, and you can develop against it using TypeScript, perfectly fine. Um, types, the TypeScript team has actually been working um, with React as well. They're doing a lot of work there, um, and building in a lot of support, uh, particularly in, in the latest version, version one point eight. Uh, so here's some resources. Um, TypeScript Lang is like the official site there. Uh, there's a bunch of documentation available. There's Play, which actually lets you, without installing anything, you can actually just play with TypeScript if you want there. It's all done in browser. Um, Plural site, there's something called TypeScript In Depth if you have a subscription to that. It's a really good, really good series. Uh, I would recommend that. Um, the typings, what I was, spec what I was talking about earlier, uh, bringing in all those declaration files. Uh, typings is what you want to use for that. And like I was saying before, anything by Anders Halsberg. He was the lead architect behind C Sharp, and he is a huge force behind TypeScript. He has a ton of good talks on YouTube and, and elsewhere and good interviews. Uh, he was on a podcast called JavaScript Java. I think that, uh, I think that was today even that they talked to him about it. Um, yeah, tons and tons of good stuff from him, and he, he just like loves talking about it. So that's all I have to say today. If anyone has any questions, feel free to ask. Uh, but uh, but if not, I hope you guys get out there and start playing with it. Even if you don't, even if you don't like it, at least you'll learn a little bit about ES6 and ES7. Can you go back to the uh, get TypeScript page for a second? I think yep. the uh, uh, was back here. That one, yeah. There we go. I was wondering TypeScript TSC version. Okay. Yeah, super, super easy to install. Yeah, especially if you already have Node. So, anyone else? Let's do this again. I'll leave it to the resources. <clears throat> okay. Oh. You can ask your question if you want. Right. <laughs> Actually, I, I want to know more about this uh, movie. You know, uh, <laughs> uh, just I was wondering, so with, with respect to that, so you said that it has a bunch of stuff with ES6, ES7. Um, is there a reason, like, why I would, like, if, what if I have a project where I'm already, like, heavily involved in JavaScript? And then I'm like, hey, look, I want to use some of these new features, and I'm looking at leveraging TypeScript, like, I want to use strong type language and stuff like yeah. that. Um, What's a, what's a good alternative, what's a good way to start moving that project forward? Because clearly I can't take my old JavaScript and just like start again. I'm not Google, right? Or I can no, Google, no. But. And like, and that's kind of why they, they went the route of making it a superscript of, or a superset of, of JavaScript, right? So from, from what, like from my experience, what I've done is um, I just, I change them to TypeScript files and have the TypeScript and just run them through the TypeScript compiler because it is jet valid TypeScript. Um, it, it may give you some, some issues, you know, if, if there's things that are defined a little bit weird, but generally it should, it should just run fine. 
So if, if you do want to start moving from an old JavaScript uh, project, just run those through the TS, so through TSC and uh, it'll spit, spit out JavaScript. And it shouldn't give you any errors, unless there's anything funky in there. Well, I wrote that JavaScript. Yeah, okay. which I know you do. Of course I do. <laughs> <laughs> Is there any way to debug in a TypeScript directly, or you just compile it and you just deal with the source in the end? Uh, I believe it does output uh, source maps so that you can go back. Um, that was like in that TS config. There was there was um, an option there to output them, um, so that'll output at the same time as all the JavaScript. Yeah. Do you think there is any drawbacks of using a dynamic language besides intelligence? Right? To using a dynamic language? To lose, to lose, you losing all the. Oh problems. yeah. It. I mean, I guess it depends on how you're approaching it because. Uh, I did notice like some of my projects coming out of them, like I would write stuff that would work well in JavaScript and TypeScript just like didn't like it at all when I started adding types. Um, particularly stuff like where you're passing in a bunch of different new things or you're trying to add you know, functions dynamically to like the prototype chain for example, like TypeScript doesn't, doesn't like that. So you do lose some features like that if, if you're trying to do a lot of Stuff on the fly, like I said, and for an example is like adding stuff to the to the prototype. Uh, you do lose that stuff, but I, I feel like the benefits out, outweigh that. In that you, in that you don't get as many subtle errors in terms of uh, what you're passing in, or maybe if you're doing that to the prototype chain, maybe you're maybe you shouldn't be doing that. Maybe that is kind of confusing if someone else comes in later. Yeah. So, when, when do you when do you not use TypeScript? Do you use TypeScript all the time for everything? No more JavaScript? Was there a decision point there? I, I feel like I should say yes. I use TypeScript all the time. Of course not. Or of course I do. Um, but I feel like TypeScript makes more sense if you're building a giant project. Like if you're building something that actually has some mass behind it, uh, that's where TypeScript makes sense. If you're building something small, you know, something that's going to exist maybe on like one page. Just like one page somewhere that people aren't going to use. Now I'm not, not talking about like a one page, single page application. I'm talking just like a little thing, like maybe a little component or something. I think JavaScript makes more sense uh, because that way you don't have to assemble that whole tool chain of having the compiler in place. Um, you just you just write JavaScript, right? So I think if you're building a larger project, it makes sense. If you're building something small, eh, maybe not. Yeah. Um, so how does TypeScript work in the sort of future scenario? You're saying like it wants to allow you to do Ecrum script six, Ecrum script seven. So what if like down the line eight to nine comes out and then their features are uh, basically on the same level as TypeScript? Mm -hmm. Is TypeScript going to try to like, incorporate those features or compile to those languages? At mm -hmm. what point does it become like oh uh, JavaScript became more like TypeScript? Then it's already a superset, right? So it's just a big if you want to have that compatibility, but then mm -hmm. it's like Mm -hmm. What's From what I understand, um, the team behind TypeScript uh, is trying to stick to those standards. So when ES8 or ES9 do come out, they want to try and incorporate that into TypeScript. What they're trying to do is they're trying to build TypeScript very close to that standard. So you can kind of almost switch between the two, aside from stuff like typing. Um, they're always going to be maybe, I guess, not behind, but like behind the standard a little bit. Uh, just because they have to implement it and make it compiled down to you know ES5 or ES6 or whatever it is. Um, but I feel just like the general feeling from the TypeScript team is that they're going to try to stay in line with those those standards as, as much as possible. Which and and you know what's what's good about that is you kind of have you don't have a ton of risk in in that trying TypeScript is because you're learning basically the future of JavaScript anyway, so you can just drop drop it later if you want. So I saw another question over there. Yeah? So does TypeScript today have somewhat feature parity with ES6 version of this all stuff set? I believe, I believe it has, don't quote me on it, but I believe it has almost everything from ES6. ES7, it's still missing some things here and there. Uh, but ES6, I think it's got pretty much everything covered. And, and most of it compiles, back, compiles down to ES5. Yeah? Just 
to add to that, to add, and also to add to your, your point about the ES7 meters and so on. But ES6 is pretty much a feature parity, as far as I know, um, because ES6 is done. The conclusion mm -hmm. with that, there's mm -hmm. no more adding more to that. So mm -hmm. when we're talking about ES7, ES7 is not done. Yeah. So although like, we're like, hey, we want to use ES7 features, like, well, we can't because we don't actually know what they are yet. Like, yeah. the group two, ECMAScript 262 is the group that holds that standard. And it, it, Microsoft has people working in TypeScript and on the Shocker or JavaScript engine that are on that standards for. So they use TypeScript as kind of an experiment. Usually we go like, hey, this is how we think we should do this. Like that's how async and await came about. Like that's yeah. a C sharp feature essentially. And they tried in TypeScript works great, and now they're doing it in ECMAScript. Right. So they're they're always they're keeping it in line for sure um, because they, they could have mm -hmm. added a whole lot more crap to it already. Like. Mm -hmm. Adding like link, people, like, yeah. Have, but they're not going to add that because that's not part of the standard. It'll never be part of that standard. Mm -hmm. So they're they're trying to keep they try to keep it in line really with JavaScript as close as they can. So I wasn't aware of that. It, it was did async and await start in TypeScript and then it's something it? that they've been they, as far as I know it showed up in C sharp. The ECMAScript group uh, started looking at it as an alternative to promises. Yeah, and. Then the TypeScript team was like, well, we're already talking about it, why don't we implement it anyway? Because mm -hmm. it makes sense. Mm -hmm. And now that they've seen it in action, people are using it, they actually mm -hmm. get metrics on how it's being used and all that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. So now they're going, hey, like, here's the data. Because there's also like, like you look at generics, generics are a feature they've talked about putting in JavaScript. They're not, they got turned down. Because mm -hmm. there's no reason to. It's, it's, an, it's, too, it's too much for yeah. JavaScript. Yeah. So they put that in TypeScript anyways because it helps. Right? So. Yeah. And the async await started in C sharp. Like what I'm showing. Yeah, you. yeah. Basically, the two back of the window is C sharp. Mm -hmm. and, well, and like I said, kind of. Oh, what's that? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, so true. like the moral of the story today is basically TypeScript is C sharp, <coughs> except it runs in the browser. Yeah, so you know C sharp already? You're like, you're golden. Have you used this in, like, in production applications? Like, if you, if you have, have you, like, or even just some smaller applications or whatever, some side projects. Mm -hmm. but what have you What have you built in this that's actually substantial? Like, what's an example? Of? Mm -hmm. I know like Microsoft has built like the Office web apps in it, mm -hmm. but I mean that's Microsoft, right? They're yeah, kind of yeah. On the hook. Yeah. So, so for me, um, well, at, at work we've done a couple of client projects uh, with that. We've done some like single page application type things okay. with TypeScript, and uh, it, it actually worked really, really well. Um, some things that I've been building on my own time is. Um, a game engine and a game to kind of work together. Uh, I initially, it was built in JavaScript, and uh, it was just like hellish to try and keep all of the interfaces and stuff like that consistent. Uh, moving that over to TypeScript, which I've been doing over the last few months, uh, has made everything way easier to use. I, I found, like, like I said, larger projects, I think it makes a lot more sense. If you're doing it on small stuff, like even, even at work, if we're doing small stuff, it doesn't really matter. Uh, if you're doing something big, like if you're building a game engine or a, a full game, I think TypeScript makes a ton of sense. The, the TFS web portal is all TypeScript. Is it? Oh, yeah. Well done. It's very well. Good for TFS. You did something right. Yeah, go ahead. Did you, uh, did you use uh, a WebGeo or OpenGeo or did you use anything like that? Oh, for the game? Um, I'm using, right now it's all, it's all 2D, so I'm just writing, I'm just drawing to the canvas. Like the, just the con, uh, context two D, I think it's called, or whatever it is. But I would like to use that in the future. There's like there's a couple of nice libraries like three JS and stuff that I want to play with. Has yeah. anyone broken any ground with TypeScript and OpenGL? Um, um, not that not that I know of. I, like I'm not super familiar with that, so I can't really give you an answer. But. Okay, so I think we're good. We're good for time and everything. All right. Well, thank you guys for coming today. Um, really appreciate it, and I uh, hope you learned something. So it's uh, thanks to all of our sponsors, which are Matchnet and uh, 
I don't know who they are right now. <laughs> <laughs> but they are great. Go to our website and give them a big high five and, and you know buy their things. Yeah, imagine. Especially imagine that because we got a guy here. Especially imagine. <laughs>